So just to specify, um, I'm not a blockchain guy. I am a formal verification guy. I am one of the original authors of the Apalache model checker together with Igor. Um, so this talk, even though it's the application is in blockchain, I am going to talk about the TLA behind it more so than the blockchain itself. So you don't need to worry about that part. So this is a collaborative effort between uh, Daniel and Josef, who are protocol designers, and Igor and myself, who are TLA guys. And if there's one takeaway I want you to have from, from this talk is that specifying systems is already difficult enough, especially things as complex as uh, consensus protocols. Verifying them is even harder, and you have to make a lot of trade-offs if you want to do it. Usually you focus on certain subsets. You isolate the most critical features. Like we had a talk before, you, you sometimes have bugs that you don't necessarily have the capacity to fix, but you make sure that the bugs you do have aren't the most critical bugs in the system. All right, so without further ado, um, I'm going to start with like a brief description of informal systems, like a PR spiel. Um, so what, what are we? So we're uh, a lot of things. Uh, among other things, we are a group of people who are um, concerned with open source stuff in the blockchain ecosystem. So uh, one part of the company, the part I'm with, we develop open source tools like Apalache and some other things I'll mention later in the talk. Another part of the company are people who work in the Cosmos ecosystem and develop blockchain-specific things, uh, algorithms, um, tools, you name it. Um, so for this talk, uh, here I have like a couple of things that we, we've developed. So we have Tendermint RS, IBC RS, which are um, utilities for blockchains. We have Themis contract. You don't have to care about that. Uh, we ha what is important for us today is that we develop and maintain the Apalache model checker uh, for TLA+. Plus. This is a tool that is unrelated to blockchain. Again, I have to emphasize this. You can use this with any TLA plus specification. In fact, I hope you do. Um, and this is the tool that I, I, I develop. And we are going to be talking about um, how we use Apalache in particular to verify TLA plus specifications that we've written um, for uh, the Tendermint consensus protocol. Um, this is sort of like a, a picture for anyone interested of the Cosmos uh, ecosystem. And uh, like the important thing is here in the middle, there's Tendermint consensus. It's the thing that tells the blockchains how to define the next block. Without consensus protocol, there is no blockchain. And without blockchain, there's no blockchain ecosystem. So it's a very critical component of the system. That's all you need to know about Tendermint consensus for now, besides the things I'll mention later. Um, so what is Tendermint consensus for, for us today? Um, so it started, everything started here in 2018 with this paper. It's called The Latest Gossip on BFT Consensus. And BFT here stands for Byzantine Fault Tolerant, which is a category of protocols that uh, basically model adversaries with completely arbitrary behavior. Right? And this is sort of, if you think about it, if you have a real system, you have a bunch of people who are trying to game the blockchain system. So this is sort of the most general model of adversary behavior. They, they can just do anything. They can forge the contents of their messages not adhering to the protocol. They can say, instead of saying, you know, I sent the message on Tuesday at 3 PM, they can say, I sent it 20 years ago. Um, and you have to so somehow account for that if your protocol is going to collect all these messages from all these potentially faulty um, processes. Um, so you can find this paper, I don't know if it's on here, you can find this paper on archive if you're interested. For now, all we care about is the fact that this paper comes with pseudocode algorithms. So this is a starting point, and from this pseudocode algorithm, um, you can then build a TLA specification, basically. All right. So um, some like short bits of Tendermint that are relevant to us today. So like I said, it's Byzantine fault tolerant. And the thing I'm going to talk about today is time. The protocol itself, as it was originally written, has no time guarantees. And it has these assumptions on correctness. So n greater than 3f, this is a, a common assumption in fault tolerant protocols. This means that um, if your uh, environment has at most one third processes faulty, then theoretically consensus should be achievable. All right, so this is the assumption. But it does not talk about time, even though uh, we want to, we'll see how we do that. We want to add time to the consensus protocol. Uh, but in the original one, there is no requirements for validators. Validators are the participants in consensus. So there's no requirements for their clocks, no synchrony. Um, but what there is, is a sort of, you can think of it as metadata. There is something called block time that is associated with every block on the blockchain. 
And this is determined from the times of the votes that are cast. It's not part of consensus, but it is something that you can read from the block. And so um, because this was, uh, and we'll see you later, because this time calculation happens and is part of the blockchain, but it's not part of the consensus, there was sort of like a need to integrate time itself into the consensus algorithm so that we could reason about this value and that it could have some sort of actual meaning. Um, so time for a change. How do you do that? How do you take a protocol and add time to it? And why, first of all, before you, we, we talk about how, why are you trying to do this in the first place? Well, the reason why you're trying to do this is because this time, like I said, is part of the block, and people write applications that read this time value from the block. And these applications sort of make an assumption of what this value means, or they may do so. So we preemptively want to avoid any sort of attack that would be based on applications' assumptions of what time means, because this time value can be anything, and any faulty process can manipulate it um, to its advantage however it likes. Um, and this is actually something that came from the users themselves. They were reading, you know, their applications were reading the blockchain, and it's like, hey, there is this time value, but for us it doesn't make sense. Um, because they thought, naturally, that the, if the time value exists on the, on the block, it's related somehow to real time. And it wasn't, and that's the key thing. But real time does matter because there's something called an unbonding period, which has, uh, I don't want to go into this right now, but like it has uh, financial consequences. Um, so this is how you get um, tokens back uh, from the ones you've delegated to the validators. Not important for this talk, but just to say, it has real life uh, consequences, but it's not related to real life. All right. So the good thing for us is that we didn't have to do a lot of the legwork. It was done for us. So our good friends, the protocol designers, um, they made a very extensive list of actual changes. You can see it here. It's all available, by the way. Everything I'm talking about today, it's all open source. It's all available online on various GitHub repositories. Um, so they, they did um, very detailed um, pseudocode still, extension of the original paper. And it has, importantly, it has references to the original paper. So we started off uh, with a lot of done, uh, work done for us. And the challenge here is going to be how are you going to take all of these changes and transform them uh, into TLA spec. And this is basically what we did. Um, so you can find the entire specification here. Um, you don't, you know, uh, I don't know if these slides will be available online, but if you Google for uh, Tendermint, you find the repository, and then you have to know that this is the branch that you have to go into. Um, so what is there currently? Actually, I have to say, it's not the latest version. It's a version before the latest version, because the latest version is still being worked on. Uh, but it's close enough so that I can talk about it today. Um, right. So things that you have to add um, in TLA. So one thing, because this protocol now talks about time as part of the consensus value, you have to somehow add additional assumptions about time. Right? It does not work if every clock can just be arbitrary. So you have something called bounded drift, which says that, OK, all of the correct processes, their times cannot differ too wildly. Their times have to be within the time envelope. Um, and this you have to incorporate in the specification. Uh, the other thing is latency. So again, this is a, a message passing protocol. So there is some communication delays. And you also have to say, if those are too wild, um, you again can't really prove anything. So you have to say there is a bounded latency. And there's this typical problem in, in these communication systems where it's actually impossible to tell whether a message was sent but just wasn't being received because of communication delays or if it wasn't sent at all. Right? So, so these are fairly standard things as far as um, communication goes. And then there's the other thing, which because time now affects um, validity, you have to ask yourself, when is a value sensible? And part of it is that it was received um, within sort of the bounded drift and end-to-end -end latency envelopes, right? So you have things like this. Now, I'm not actually, I'm going to show you like fragments of the specification. I'm not going to show you at any point the whole specification. It's too massive. It's actually kind of besides the point what the full specification is. If you want to read it, it's available online. What I'm going to show you in the rest of the talk is basically a sort of blueprint on how you go about writing specifications. What is important? What are the things you have to take care of? And what are the things that you might actually not know are relevant when you're specifying um, protocol or an algorithm, but become very important once you start trying to apply um, sort of any sort of tooling to that, right? Like what is important for TLC or for Appalachia in our particular case? Um, so 
observations for this new extension. It's called proposer-based timestamp. Um, so the consensus over the payload has not changed, right? So there is still this value that was previously consensed upon that's still part of it. Now time is also part of it, but the value over, cons uh, over the payload, uh, consensus over the payload has not changed. Second thing, which is actually, which is actually interesting and different from what you heard in the previous talk, um, we are now actually more concerned with verifying liveness than we are safety um, because, and this comes back to it, you know, you verify the things, they have the capacities for verifier that you think you need to verify. Um, liveness is less obvious in this new extension and it is more clear to everyone involved that safety is still preserved so we did not go about as extensively verifying safety. So this talk is more about liveness which may be a little bit unusual. Um, and the other thing that's interesting, just abstractly, this protocol actually has a better fault tolerance threshold. The other one was you could tolerate up to a third of faulty processes. Now you can tolerate up to a half of faulty processes. But this is all under the assumptions of synchrony, so bounded clock drift, bounded uh, messaging delays. And this is sort of what the invariant, uh, again, you can, you can read this uh, on GitHub. I'm not going to go into details of what this is, because right now it doesn't matter. So now comes the big question that's like the central part of what I want to talk to you about today is mastering Apalachia, or more specifically, how do you actually use verification tools on specifications? Because um, if you just write the entire system, the entire specification, and throw it at a tool, it's likely not going to work just because of real time constraints. Either your state space is too large or your traces are too long, whatever. Um, before I go that, uh, into detail here, like a brief summary of Apalachi for those of you that might not be familiar with it. Apalachi is a symbolic model checker. It's a symbolic bounded model checker for TLA plus. So the way you use Apalachi is you have to specify an execution length that you're trying to analyze. So let's say up to eight steps. Um, and then Apalachi will generate actually SMT constraints. And in particular, it uses set three in the background. So Nikolai's uh, work is actually very relevant to us. Um, so it transforms the TLA specification into a series of SMT constraints up to um, you know, describing executions up to a bounded length. And then it, you know, it throws those at the solver. And if the solver finds a counterexample uh, or a model, well, then you have uh, a witness to the violation of the invariant. And if not, then the invariant holds up to that length. Right. Okay, so how do you use Apalachia? So the first thing, and this is actually something that might be a little bit unintuitive, if you're, um, if you're not familiar with uh, SMT, actually, is like the way you model time in the specification actually matters a lot. So you have two very natural ways of defining time. So remember, this is a specification that talks about time. Every process has a local clock. And presumably, over the course of an execution, these local clocks change, increase. Right? So you have two ways intuitively of doing it. One is the most natural one. So your, your time is an abstraction of some unit of time, nanoseconds, minutes, hours, days, whatever. Right? Every, every local clock has a value, and then potentially in, in a step, this value, and this is for one local clock, of course, like if you had many, you'd have a function here. Like in one step, your time increases by one. So clock has time t0, t0 plus one, t0 plus two, and so on. And the other way to do it is to say, well, okay, I have a time value that I sample from either int or some bounded interval, um, and say, I, I take my clock into the next state where the time is greater than the current time, but it doesn't necessarily have to take by one. And you wouldn't think it just from looking at this, but actually, under the hood, these two things have a different impact on performance. Because if you think about this as an encoding in SMT, um, the t plus one forces the solver to reason about arithmetic. Right, so plus, for humans it's obvious, right? Like one plus one, that obviously is two, plus one is three, and so on. Um, for a tool, it has to actually solve the math problem as, in, as encoded in uh, SMT constraints. Whereas this one is simpler. Right? You're not talking about arithmetic, you're talking about still um, integer inequalities, and inequalities, of course, which are simple enough. So uh, it turns out that if you can, it's better um, at least within the, when using Apalachia, to use this form um, because the constraints that it generates are simpler to use. Um, does this matter? Sometimes it does, and sometimes it matters significantly. Um, so this is on time. So this is uh, an excerpt from, from the specification. You can see how it's actually done in, in the previous version, and the current version is slightly different. 
Um, but what you have is you have uh, sort of a collection of a bounded interval of timestamps, um, and you say, okay, well, there is a notion of real time. I, I pick a number that is greater than the current number, and that's my new real time, and then I increase all of the local clocks by whatever this, uh, the difference is. So if my real time takes by plus seven, I increase all the local clocks by plus seven. If it takes by plus 4,000, that's what I increase the local clocks by. I don't care if it's one or two or three, just that the new time everywhere is greater than the previous time. Right? Um, yeah, that's all I want to talk about here. So the other, other thing, which again, doesn't necessarily seem immediately obvious, is action composition, or we call this transition density, if you will. Um, so you have a bunch of ways of reaching certain states in your state space, forgetting for a second about the TLI specification, right? Um, and when you talk about reachability, right, um, these two ways of doing things are in, in some sense equivalent. So you can reach a state either by a sequence of intermediate states or directly sometimes. Like a great example of this is, for example, here, you have a function update at a single point, right? Let's say, for example, in the previous case, we saw uh, local clocks, but let's say you, um, you want to update one local clock. You say, okay, well, I pick a process for which I'm going to update the local clock, and that process's local clock now becomes something else. And if you think about it, if you have 10 processes, you can, um, you can describe the change in the local clocks of 10 processes as 10 steps in which in every step a different local clock, uh, a different process is chosen, and then this happens, right? Or you can say, well, I pick a subset of processes and I update them all in one step. Now again, as far as reachability goes and as far as the um, state space is concerned, these two things, barring other parts of the code that might change this, but they're equivalent in that sense. So if you prove um, that this transition preserves some invariant, then well, this sequence will as well, and vice versa. Uh, but uh, as far as model checking goes, right, again, there is a difference. Because remember, Apalache is a bounded model checker. So one of the things that you have to budget for is the length of executions. So if you're trying to do something like this, well, then just the fact that you have to update things in multiple places using typically like the same formula will eat up a lot of the allowance for depth that you, you allocate to the solver, right? And so it's usually much more efficient in terms of like the, uh, the degree, like the percentage of the system that you're able to explore within the same bounded execution length um, to try to pack as many things into a single transition as possible. Now, Palacha is smart enough because it, it uses symbolic constraints um, to where this actually, in some cases, might be more efficient than this. Um, I'm not going to talk about details of this right now. But in terms of like exploration, this is typically, while very intuitive for a human to write and also to reason about when reading a TLS specification, it's much worse for the tools um, because your executions will be, uh, sorry, your uh, traces will be um, longer uh, if you want to reach the same state, um, so it will be slower for Apalachi to explore more of the situation. Yeah, anything, some 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 function that doesn't matter what it is, like some well, operator, I guess, not function here. Um, this is more symbolic. So typically, like for example, let's say you know f of x is um, the value that was previously there plus seven, right? Um, again, you can do this in one step or. Uh, one step or many steps, many steps usually better than one step. Um, sorry, not many steps. Uh, many at once is usually better than one by one in many steps. Um, I, don't have a, I don't have a code excerpt for this one. But, um, so the other thing, and this is a, a, an Appalachia specific feature, is simulation. So I've talked about verification for now, and this, this was mostly in reference to um, like bounded model checking. But Apalache also supports, and this is an excerpt from our documentation, something called a simulation mode, right? Um, and a simulation mode is invoked basically the same way as uh, model checking. You, you give it a specification and, and the invariance that you want to uh, verify across the, for, that, for that specification. And then you say, OK, how many runs do you want to simulate? And what simulation does is um, it picks uh, basically non-deterministic choices randomly. And, ex, uh, and generates one long sequence of transitions with no non-determinism. So um, just a little bit of background on, on the way Apalache handles transitions. So if your next formula is something like A or B or C, 
Apalache constructs something called a symbolic transition decomposition. So it will generate symbolic transitions that are usually, you know, A, B, and C, um, or maybe something more granular. And then it, it picks at every step for the given depth. It picks one of these transitions at random. So for example, if you, if you, give, uh, if you give it simulation over four steps with A, B, or C as, as a symbolic transitions, it will say, okay, I will try A, then C, then C, then A, and see what happens. And then in the next run, I'll try A, then B, then B, then B, and see what happens. And it does this a number of times. And you can do some sort of uh, math on this to figure out like the percentage, what number of simulation runs you have to do to cover some percentage of all of the scenarios, if you like. But the point is, the takeaway here is, um, it's much, much, much faster because there is no non-determinism in choosing the action that's just done randomly. But the flip side, of course, it's incomplete because there is no guarantee that even if you do like a thousand, a million, a hundred million simulations, that you actually cover all of the behavior. And that's what check does. So these two things are actually uh, dual one to another, right? And if you think about it, the way specs are written, specs are not written um, you know, from one partial spec to one complete spec in one step. In between, there's a bunch of iterated versions, and every time you introduce a new operator, you're likely, you know, you likely make a mistake somewhere. Like the more complicated an invariant, the larger the likelihood you're gonna have to revise it multiple times. And simulation mode ha helps a lot in this phase between the first version and the final version where you're iterating on the specification because it really finds, typically, it finds errors very quickly. Errors that you as a user have introduced, not necessarily errors in the specification. Um, is there a question? So there is no automatic partial order reduction of any kind. This is, so the thing I showed here in the previous slide, um, where is it? Ah, right. So this is something that I encourage people to do manually, actually. Um, so this is, this is what I call a DIY action composition. Um, so simulation works over whatever it is, is written. It doesn't try to automatically do any poor. Okay, sorry. Yes. You may, be, you may be able to, but so far, so this is, I would say, this is one of the newest features. So we might consider something like that in the future. So far we haven't, and it's been fairly useful as is right now. Uh, but yes, you, you're right in the, in the sense that you, you, could, you could do something like that. It's typically something you want to do eventually. Um, but right now we haven't, and this is basically just the most naive way of doing this right now. And it already works fairly well. Um, Sure. So, so I think in the consensus protocols, uh, your collaborator, uh, Cesar, uh, and fourth uh, floor, mm -hmm. uh, they, they, they view as well. So uh, you have papers on, um, you view these protocols as bottom-based. You essentially have an epoch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually, that's not, not true here. You don't have that kind of strong synchrony. Oh, you don't have that problem. No. Um, all right, so um, what was I, okay, simulation. Yeah, so takeaway here is uh, while you're iterating on the spec, use simulation. When you're done with it or when you feel like you're done with it, then you use the check mode and then you actually cover for the given bound, of course, like all of the possible behaviors of a given length. Um, Right, so the other thing, which is also Apalachia specific, um, is something called generators, bounded vo value generators. So oftentimes, um, so there's a bunch of ways you can do this, but oftentimes you wanna say, okay, just, I have a set of a certain size, or I have a value that is an integer, but I don't care what value it is. Um, 
And this is how you actually do it in Apalachi, the most efficient way. So there's something called gen. It's, a, it's an operator in one of the libraries that we provide. Um, so if, you use a, if you're using Apalachi, you can just use extends Apalachi the way you would extends integers, and you get access to all of the Apalachi specific operators, this being one of them. Um, and gen gives you, um, so here, if, if you're generating primitives like integers or strings, um, it just gives you a value of that sort. So gen k of int just gives you some integer. And the more interesting one is when you have collections. So gen n of set generates uh, a set, or gen generates a record, or generates a sequence, anything like that. Um, the, if you think about it, the tree of which has bounded width. So in, in the set terms, this means like gen three of set type. So Apalache, just um, maybe to repeat, Apalache has a type system. And you might have seen this in, in the operator annotations. Oh, ah, here. So you might have seen this in the operator annotations. Apalache has a type system, a static type system. Um, so every operator is not necessarily annotated. It can be inferred, uh, but you can also annotate them. Uh, but essentially, in Apalachi, every uh, term in the intermediate uh, um, representation has a type. Um, and so if you're using, uh, let's say, Gen 3 set where you're expecting a set of integers, then this will have type set of integer. So if you say, give me uh, Gen 2 set of strings, then what you get is some set that contains up to two strings, and those strings could be anything. Um, and the reason this is easy is because, again, Apalache backend uses SMT constraints, and it's typically very cheap to specify a value of a certain sort without any additional constraints, um, instead of doing things like uh, choose magic or anything like that, which uh, if you're using choose in Apalache, there's you know, the set that you're choosing from, and you have to describe that, and that takes up constraints in the solver, whereas this does not. Um, so a more complex example, if, you, if you're choosing um, a set of sets, um, it will give you, you know, it, it can always give you the empty set, or it can give you a set with two elements or three elements, and each of those sets can have up to three elements. Um, so this is sort of something that you might want to consider using. And why and how you would use this? Um, so in this particular protocol, um, the question, and, and actually in every Byzantine fault harmonic protocol is, how do you model faulty processes? And one of the canonical ways of modeling faulty processes is by saying, OK, well, faulty processes don't have to obey the protocol anyway, so their timestamps and their message contents can be whatever. And so if you have a message pool, what you say is, actually, OK, I'm just going to pre-populate my message pool with all of the messages sent by the faulty processes that they could have been sent at any point in the actual protocol. And then in the actual specification, I don't have to have a transition that describes the behavior of a faulty process. I'm just going to preload them all in the initial state. Right? Uh, but this is expensive, typically, because when you're talking about um, all of the messages that could potentially be sent by a faulty process, that is usually a very, very, very large set. And so if you're picking from a very, very large set, the encoding uh, is actually going to be very, very large itself. Um, so something you might want to consider in, in a scenario like this is you're going to say, OK, well, I will pick a set of faulty messages of, of one of these three types. Each one I will initialize um, with some arbitrary set, and then I will add constraints saying that this set actually has to belong to the set of faulty messages. Um, and in this way, you're basically saying, I will initialize my set with a subset of, of this or this or this that is of a bounded size, and it's more efficient to, to write it this way. And this is actually one of the key things that, that we needed for this protocol. Because if, if you think about uh, constraint-based encoding, if your initial state constraints are actually very large and very heavy, well, then so are all of the other constraints. Because the constraints for a state that's three steps removed from the initial state are at least as large as the constraints of the initial state itself. Um, and in practice, they are much larger. So if your initial state is very, very bloated, well, then you, you kind of get stuck in the initial state on the exploration. Uh, on the other hand, if you go in the completely opposite direction, if your initial state has no messages by any faulty process and you choose to model faulty process message sending as an action, well, then you have the opposite problem of your traces being very, very long because, for example, you need uh, four, five, six messages by faulty processes and you're only allocating a depth of eight or 10 or 12 or whatever. So 
This is sort of, again, this is the thing I wanted to talk about the most, it's the trade-offs, right? So big specifications require trade-offs to be able to verify even parts of them. And this is one of the most clearly visible ones. So you have this problem of, do I want longer traces, or do I want bigger initial states? And generators are a nice sort of in-between point where I say, okay, well, I have some of the messages in the initial state, I bound them, and this is, and then of course you have to say, well then all of my properties um, have been you know, proven with the assumption that there are at most this many messages by faulty processes. But that's just part of life. All right. Um, so we actually, you know, we wrote the spec as, it was, as you can find it in, um, in the GitHub repository, and we ran some tests against it. And so we, we ran two sets of tests um, on this sort of machine, uh, one with three correct and one faulty, and one with two correct and two faulty. And you might say, okay, well, that's not a lot of processes. I was like, well, actually, if you increase the number of processes, um, you, you can quickly find that um, it becomes, you know, actually impossible to verify. For, first of all, TLC uh, usually just chokes on the initial state, even for Apalachi. Uh, you could do maybe five processes, six would be pushing it, eight, 10, 12, very unlikely. Um, so three correct, one faulty, and uh, two correct, two faulty. And the reason we do it this way, um, these two sets of experiment is, uh, remember there is this assumption in all Byzantine fault tolerant um, protocols that you have to have more correct processes than faulty processes. Right. So in, in this scenario, you have, um, you fulfill the condition that, I mean, even a stronger condition, like less or exactly one fourth of the processes, which is less than a third, less than a half, is faulty. Um, and the synchrony assumptions are baked into the algorithm. So presumably, um, this um, specification satisfies the assumptions of correctness. Therefore, you should be able to prove correctness. And in this one, it doesn't. So you don't have this, so you have, um, you do not have less than a half of processes faulty. You have actually exactly half of processes faulty, and that's too much. So um, it violates the assumptions. Therefore, you should be able to, if it violates the assumptions, you should be able to show that correctness doesn't hold. All right, so we have two sets of experiments. Um, and as you can see, even, even for these um, relatively small parameters, and for, for all of the concessions made in the specification, it um, took this machine about three days to run a check of length. Um, and on the other hand, to find a counterexample, um, it took about two days. Right? So these are, you know, I think about it, are these times too long? Are these times fast? Well, it depends. How often, I'll take you in a second, how often are you actually verifying these protocols, right? Like if you have a major version of this protocol every five months, then three days isn't, if you think about it, is actually that much. If you have to integrate this as part of like CI, then this is way too much. Yeah. A uh, quick question about the contact sample here. Did you also try to find it with the simulation mode? So uh, this, uh, these ex uh, experiments predate the simulation mode. Say that again? Uh, this predates the simulation mode. Oh. So this was run before. Um, and this is actually something where, so like I said, um, this was done on a slightly older version of PBTS. And we are definitely uh, going to work on a simulation for the newer version. And we're going to post this somewhere online. I th so these experiments also, these, this is all available online on GitHub. You can. You know, you can download Apalachi, you can run this yourself if you don't believe me. I'm actually, I'm encouraging you to. Uh, hopefully you have decent enough documentation for people to get started. We have uh, CLI, um, we have outputs in various different formats. Um, so yeah, uh, so what's next, right? So we, we've done the experiments, we have like a prelim preliminary version of the spec. Uh, wh what are we gonna do next? So the next thing is something that's called inductive invariance. So, an inductive invariant, just um, to reiterate, is an invariant that if you can show that it holds in the initial state and that is preserved by a transition, you can prove that it holds throughout the entire system. And Apalachia is actually really, really good for inductive invariants because you can, if you can encode an inductive invariant, you can use Apalachia to prove that it holds for the entire system, right? Because Apalachia is a symbolic model checker, so if you show it, um, if you, if you can write an inductive invariant, and that's the hard part, uh, then, then that is basically as much as you can hope for as, as far as verifying a specification goes. Uh, but, and it's a pretty major but, um, inductive invariants are really, really hard to write and really, really, really time consuming, and you need some very smart people to dedicate time for it, yes? One more question with regards to the previous slide. Um, yeah. Did you try to simulate the specification with TLC? Um, no, for this one, no. Um, I mean, so we tried TLC and we didn't get 
past the initial state. Yeah, okay, you can always add yeah, an right. artificial initial state, right, and then. Right. Um, okay, but you didn't. I'll, yeah. uh, you know, I'll make sure to, to pass this on. We will, we will do like uh, comparative testing. Um, right. So yeah, so, um, so I showed this here, and so this is um, of a version of the previous version. It's written by Igor and, and Josef. This is a collection of all of the lemmas that you need to, to write an inductive invariant about the non-proposer-based time variant of, of tender moonlight -like plan. And um, Igor and Josef are both very, very smart guys who have done a lot of work uh, with TLA and in protocol design. And uh, this was not easy to write. And if you think about, if you work for a company, like if you're a PhD student, you have all the time in the world. You can work on this stuff, you can publish it, uh, you can make a thesis on it, it's fine. If you're a company, uh, you have to pay people for their time, and then this becomes a little bit harder to justify. Um, ideally, so like fortunately, we have the, you know, we are going to be doing this probably in the future, so our company is going to pay us for that, which is nice. Uh, but not all, not all companies can afford or necessarily need to go through this time-consuming process because at the end of the day, you know, uh, you have to decide what you want from your TLA specification. How important is it that you verify certain properties? Now, for us, it is actually very important because Tendermint consensus is super critical to the entire Cosmos ecosystem. So, having you know as much information about it as possible, as as much um, as many guarantees as possible, that is very important for us. Um, and so, yeah, I just wanted to show you. And this was uh, this is like the last part of this, I think. So the last lemma, which was the one that eluded Igor for a very long time, and have helped him out. So these are lemmas, right? These are not just one-liners, like if x is greater than two, then something else. Like these are actually complicated logical formulas. And all of, like, not all of them are this complicated, but this one is very complicated. And you need someone, you can look at this for a little bit. You need someone with like a lot of experience in protocol design, actually, not just TLA. You need someone with a lot of experience in protocol design to even come up with this property in the first place. Because if you read the English, if you read the English text, right, um, I don't know how many people like intuitively think this is like an important property to, to write down. Like some people might brush it off, you know, like it's obvious, it's uh, clear from the specification, I don't know. But for inductive invariance, you need to write it down, and uh, sometimes that's hard. That's the takeaway from this section. But we are, like I said, we are going to try to do work on, on the proposer-based time system. The good news is that you can reuse a lot of work from the non-proposer-based time system uh, um, TLA specification, because some of these properties have nothing to do with the now consensus over time. A lot of them do. Uh, some don't, and it's always easier to work off of existing work than to start from scratch. Um, so the other thing, of course, besides any sort of uh, model checking approach is proofs, right? So if you have a specification, presumably um, this is, you know, TLA, it's a logic, you can, you can prove things with it. Um, so one thing is you have TLAPS. Um, you could use TLAPS. Um, it, we don't have anyone in from who's an expert in TLAPS, but there are some people who can use it. Um, there's some questions open with regards to how do you deal with like the whole set of integers, which might be important for this. If you want to model timestamps properly as you know unbounded, you got any integers? How do you do that in TLAPS? The other thing is Ivy. So um, there was a proof for um, the older version done by um, Juliana Loza and the people at Galois. This is a fragment of here. You can again you can find the Ivy stuff over here. Uh, you could write it in Ivy again. Um, it's you need to be able to write in IV. It's not easy. This uh, proof is fairly large. Uh, but it is, you know, if it is more conclusive than a model checking result, unless, of course, unless you find inductive invariance, in which case bonded model checking is complete and is just as good as a proof. Um, and then the last option is you could use retla. And if you don't know what retla is, uh, that's not surprising because I'm going to talk about it, f I think, 4 now, not 4.30, so this is a bit old. But yeah, I have another talk later today where I'm going to talk about this retla thing, and you can ask me questions about it there. Um, so other stuff, and this is like a very complicated slide. Other stuff we're working on is yeah, it's not this last slide. Uh, it's not necessarily related to what you heard today. Um, so we are working on other open source tools that, um, in this particular case, are tuned a little bit more towards blockchain, but are still TLA based. So we have something called Atomcraft. Um, which is basically how do you use TLA to generate actual tests for your implementation, right? So what we have here is this whole process of taking TLA, using Apalate, 
to, given the invariance, generate traces that are interesting, taking those traces and transforming those traces into CLI calls for this particular blockchain. So you can use, and this is all automated to an extent, it's called Atomcraft. So basically the idea is you write a TLA spec and you can use that spec to give you actual calls to your as implemented system without knowing you know, anything about the details of the system, just having the interface available to you. And this is sort of like a, an integration testing tool. Uh, again, it's open source. It's very new, so I think the, the, it's, it's open source, but it's new. Um, it was released, I want to say, less than a month ago. Uh, and so it's very much you know, in development. But keep an eye out. If this is something that interests you, you can talk to me. Uh, I can forward you to the actual people who are developing this. Um, it's driven by Apalache, but theoretically, you could substitute with uh, any sort of model checking that generates traces. Um, yeah, so that's about as much as I want to talk about today. I would be happy to answer any questions about this or about Apalache um, or about Retail A or anything about the company you find interesting. Uh, find me in the hallway. I'm wearing the prop t-shirt. So uh, yeah, thanks for your time. Any questions are welcome. Hi. Um, this might be a little bit too, of a, uh, too much of a consensus question. Um, so you initially mentioned um, that uh, you're trying to include block time uh, as an arithmetic average, if I understood that correctly. Oh, um, so the, the, current, the current implementation of, of Tendermint computes the block time as a, as a weighted average of all the validator uh, times, and the weights are the voting power like, per percentages. Um, all right. Uh, so I'm, uh, uh, I guess that's, that's actually my question. So um, I'm aware that um, you can relatively, or you can use compute block time um, through median because that's not uh, vulnerable to outliers, right? But a Byzantine replica uh, could just give you a timestamp which is like 20 years in the future or 20 years in the back, uh, you know? And then your arithmetic average would kind of be largely skewed by that. And so I'm wondering how you get around that. So, so the, the, problem, uh, the problem with medians is that you can't, uh, or at least I'm not intuitively aware of like framework where you can do weighted, I'm sure you can do weighted medians in some sense, but like the, the problem here is that you're not actually taking just the, av uh, the average, you're taking the weighted average. Um, the justification for that behind the scenes is sort of the validators with more voting power are more trustworthy, so their time should matter more. Um, and that's, that's the reason it's answered. But like this question is sort of moot by the fact that we now have this version where time is part of the consensus anyway. So you don't need to do this median average because now you have an algorithm that just computes time um, from, from the proposed time, but because you have the synchrony assumption, this time actually means something. All right. So the so synchrony assumption is, is, is essentially the, the important part here which makes that possible because your sy system is synchronous. Um, well, not synchronous per se. Like, I guess this is called partially synchronous. Like you, you have this assumption that clocks are not too far mm -hmm. apart, but individual actions don't need to all happen within yep. uh, like a sequence. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so for I know you said you know inductive invariants are sort of a next step that you know and, and using them are not um, necessarily obvious, right? Mm -hmm. um, I guess I have a question because, like, to me, working in sort of like induction is, you know, a natural sort of thing when dealing with proofs, sure. right? But, you know, if you're using something like F star, like, you know, there's a system where you can get sub goals and, you know, you can, there's a way of getting feedback as to what you need to prove, mm -hmm. right? Um, is there something similar, like how would you sort of create that experience inside of TLA plus because you don't have access to, yeah. to, to that system? So if, if you're just using the like model checking approach, there's really no sort of feedback like that. The best advice I can offer you is use simulation when you're doing this. Um, because this is actually, this is Igor's observation that um, basically, when you write these invariant fragments, let's say, right, because you write like lemmas, you can call them as well. When you write these lemmas, typically you're not going to write the right one. You, you, the, the problem is you don't even know the way in which it's incorrect necessarily from the fact that it's incorrect. 
Um, I, I don't know if TLAPS would be more helpful in this way in, in terms of like dynamic feedback. Certainly in the model checking mode, the only answer you can get is there is or there isn't a counterexample. Right. And then it's up to you sort of to, to tweak the process in such a way that you understand what it means for there to be a counterexample and how to fix it. Um, would there be, and this is kind of a, an ephemeral question, but like where you could effectively, like if this would be easier to prove in cock. In what? In cock or something, right? Well, uh, and then well, now I mean, we're going to, you know, like I'm assert that it's true. I'm going to challenge this a little bit. Like <laughs> easier to prove in cock when you have a cock specification already written, maybe. How, how easy is it to write a cock specification uh, compared to a TLA specification, we can argue. Because right. um, it's like it's usually very lengthy, very difficult, very, and that's the thing. So one of the ideas is like we're trying to um, get TLA closer to the engineers and COC is very far away from anything you can give to engineers. Mm -hmm. And it's actually, um, so my colleague can't really, can't really take questions, but I did want to ask him about this. Um, you know, how do you, how do you take this and give it to engineers because the, you know, I've, I've heard this so many times, like, why do I need all of this? I just have unit tests, my, my code is fine. And you're like, well, actually, you know, like, how do you, how do you know which things to put mm -hmm. in unit tests if you don't even have an understanding of your, anyways, this is maybe a bit too, <laughs> too off topic on my end. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're good. Like, I was thinking of something like Y3, for instance, where, you know, Y3 can, use an assault of proof techniques, and if it fails, well, you can insert your own proof, right? Is there something, like an, an analog to that here, maybe? Well, not, not in our frameworks. We're just, yeah. we're building model checkers, that's it. We have time for more, yeah. I, I just have an addendum to what um, you just said. If you care about um, validating your inductive invariant candidates, then Leslie wrote a paper a node in 2018 called using TLC to check inductive invariance. So they use randomization, also simulation, so that in the process of discovering your inductive invariance, you can still use the tool and get kind of incremental feedback. Uh, the next uh, question I have is, so you mentioned that your model checker does a bounded exploration, uh, either like complete or just sample, sample traces. Um, and you had that example of um, finding, uh, yeah, exactly, this is a slide with 50% Byzantine replicas um, that where it found um, a counterexample, yeah, in, in, uh, in eight steps. Um, and I'm wondering, so you've earlier talked about that a step can, can mean different things, right? It, uh, and so, can you translate that to like, I mean, Tendermint is a three round commit protocol, right? Like, um, so how many t steps in the Tendermint protocol, like where all replicas essentially answer, uh, would, would that correspond to? Oh, I, I don't know this by heart. Um, so there is, if you, go to the, if you go to the GitHub, there is actually, um, the counterexample trace is included, so you can, you can presumably you can read that trace and, and reconstruct um, what this means, these steps, how they map back into Tendermint steps. I don't know this by heart. Um, we tried, like I said, we tried making the steps as compact as possible because this allows us to get more information from the same length of execution in Apalachia. Um, but this is about as much information I can give you without looking it up. All right. Do you know by chance which uh, property failed? Uh, um, it's actually funny to bring it up. Uh, the answer is no, but this is exactly, we're actually currently working on a post factum trace exploration where basically for exactly this reason, like you have a conjunction of seven properties and you know, you can read the trace and manually map yeah. out which property is violated, but that is super time consuming. And it would be so much nicer, and it's actually not that hard in this Appalachian framework to just do this. So this is something that we're actively working on. Um, so I actually, as soon as I stop traveling this month, I'm gonna go back and start implementing this, so yeah. Very cool, thank you. Uh, okay, it's lunch. Let's thank the speakers again. Thank you.